Thank you all. I think we'll get started because this is just after one o'clock now in Western Australian time. And welcome to the second CSIRO webinar, or as I'm calling them, the Covideo conferences. Uh, this one is going to be presented by Dr. Carsten Laukham, and it's around uh, spectral mineralogy and looking for alteration in hydrothermal uh, footprints. Uh, thank you all for those that have joined and turned off their videos straight away, and hopefully most of the microphones will remain muted. We had a few glitches in the first one. Uh, for those of you that did attend the first presentation by Steve Barnes, that is now available on YouTube where you can view it. Uh, if you look at my LinkedIn post, there's a link there for it, but I will also try and circulate that around in other mechanisms also. Carsten give a presentation for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, and then there'll be a chance to ask questions. If a question comes to mind while you're viewing the presentation, please use the comments uh, box on the side of this uh, WebEx screen, uh, and I'll try and keep track of those comments and we'll ask Carsten those questions at the end. So uh, we'll now pass over to Carsten for his presentation. Okay, thanks Ryan. Um, thanks, uh, Ryan, can you hear me still? <laughs> Just to make sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks Ryan for the introduction and um, thanks everyone for calling in. Um, today I would like to give you a little presentation about um, entitled uh, Mineral Composition Trends in Hydrothermal Mineral Systems um, Inferred from Reflectance Spectra. So it's about, um, the presentation will be about how we can map, for example, geochemical um, variations and um, variations in the chemistry of certain minerals um, using a reflectance spectroscopy from the microscope scale, um, but also with drill core sensing technologies, airborne sensors, and maybe even um, spaceborne sensors. So the outline of my talk is basically, I um, will start with an introduction into, um, into the topic of reflectance spectroscopy very briefly and an update about spectral sensing technologies that are available for us that are working in exploration in the mining industry. Um, and then I'm going to dive in straight into geochemical exchange vectors and I'm going to focus on white micas, uh, which many of you know already about and using with spectral sensing, um, but also talk about garnet and some other um, um, exchange vectors we can, we can map. After that, we're going to have a look um, briefly at, at um, what crystallinity of certain minerals can tell us, uh, what is a spectral maturity index, and what's, what's that about this mineral hydration and hydroxylation, how we can extract these uh, parameters from the reflectance spectra, and then finishing up with a summary. <clears throat> okay, so starting with the basics, um, it, reflectance spectroscopy, very simple. In the end, we have a light source here on this slide shown on the top left. That can be our um, light source in, in the spectrometer, like in the field spectrometer, for example, or it can be the sun if you're using remote sensing. And we basically um, um, will analyze um, the, the, the radiation that is emitted from the light source. That one is um, interacting with the surface material of interest. So it could be the Earth's um, surface or our drill core, for example. And um, then this radiation will interact with that surface and there's a quite a complex uh, combination of um, um, scattering processes, volume and surface scattering processes and um, diffuse versus specular reflection. And um, I'm not going to go in, into detail about this, just stating basically that this is a quite um, complex physical process. And the, some of the radiation gets absorbed, some of the radiation gets um, reflected and um, can then be detect, detected by our detectors, by our field spectrometers or remote sensing instruments, for example. And in, in the data that we collect, we end up with these um, spectral signatures. And there's just a, um, one shown schematically on the bottom right of this diagram, where we have certain absorption features, in this case, a, a trough, which basically tells us that um, something in, in, the, in the material that we are scanning is uh, leading to the absorption, and this can be due to electronic or vibrational processes. These are the, the, main, the two main processes that lead to absorption features in reflectance spectra, not only in the visible near entropic infrared, but also in the mid-wave and thermal infrared. So if we now move on to the next slide, and um, I just want to 
uh, give an overview about how these squiggly lines look like and also which technologies can be used to collect uh, which wavelength range. Most people in um, exploration and mining industry have used um, the visible near and short wave infrared wavelength regions, which are also uh, described here at the top. And we're looking at um, five reflectance spectra here that are just stacked on top of each other. And um, with these um, spectral signatures, we see certain troughs at certain wavelength ranges. And each of these troughs basically tells us something about the physical chemistry of a mineral. And as I said before, um, there are two main reasons for these absorption features in this um, part of the spectrum that we are looking at. They are the, the large group of the vibrational modes. So these would be, for example, um, hydroxyl related absorption features like we find in white micas or carbonate um, related absorption features like in carbonates. And um, the other large group are these electronic modes, um, which we have, um, for example, in ferric oxides, in, in hematite, goethite, and we see this very intense and very broad um, ferric iron features here. Um, at the bottom of this, of this diagram, I have listed just a few um, examples of spectrometers that we have at hand. We can, they are commercially available and we can buy them and we can use them to analyze our samples to collect uh, reflectance spectra in the visible near and short wave infrared. So there are these field spectrometers like from Malvern Panalytical, also called ASDs. Um, these are the field spec and Terra specs. Um, and then we've got this mach these machines from Spectral Evolution, another company from the uh, United States that produces similar instruments. And of course, um, working for CSRO, um, of course, I want to highlight also the high level instrument um, that was developed at CSRO is, and is now um, was commercialized with, with, with CoreScan a couple of years ago. And um, this one scans the same wavelength region. And then we've got a number, number of um, in imaging spectrometers. So with these ones, you can create hyperspectral images of your surface um, that you want to analyze. And um, they are also um, uh, conveyor-based scanners around like the quality spec from uh, Malvern Panalytical again. But we are, we are most, most of us, most of the people using reflectance spectroscopy are a little bit stuck in the visible near and short infrared. Um, but there's much more to it and not, not, not only for the sake of spectral nerds, but um, there's actually much more in, in other wavelength regions to see and they're um, adding these additional wavelength regions like this midwave infrared and the thermal infrared um, provides us basically with more information about the mineralogy. Um, uh, the best example probably being that in a thermal infrared we can also um, analyze or characterize minerals like simply quartz, feldspar, um, garnet, pyroxene, um, and these minerals, uh, we were not able to see them basically in just in the visible near and short infrared here shown on the left hand side. Um, the midwave infrared in the middle is a little bit of a new thing, but um, um, CSRO and Korsken and others are working on that reference region heavily to make that more accessible also to um, exploration and mining geologists. And there are handheld spectrometers around. Um, there's one from Ageland, for example, handheld FTIRs um, that uh, can be used to collect basically good parts of the short wave infrared, mid wave, and thermal infrared. So we have a number of technologies around available that we can use to collect different parts of the of the spectrum, of the visible and infrared part of the spectrum, which we then can use for exploration and mining. And it's, I really want to stress that it's important to use the full wavelength range um, to extract the physical chemistry of minerals um, to get the most out of it, basically. But it depends on the on the application, what you're interested in. Good, just some, um, an, another list on this next slide, slide number six. Uh, I've listed some, some of the example technologies that we have available and some pictures. Um, so we've got these proximal sensing instruments. They, are, they have a hyperspectral resolution. It means they have lots of bands that are collected across the spectrum. Um, and for example, here we've got a Terra spec from Malvern Panalytical. Um, but also here in the middle on the top left, we've got the handheld FTIR from Ageland that we are using quite a lot um, in, in CSRO since since past two years for, for example, for lithium deposits. Then we've got here on the top right a picture of the Heilogger, um, which collects visible near short wave and thermal infrared um, simply from, from drill core trays, but also um, drill chips. And we've got the remote sensing instruments here, an example um, of the, it's just a, a view of the HiMap system that's, that's from Hivista Corporation, an Australian company. And with this instrument, you can collect visible near short infrared reflectance spectra. 
and on the bottom right, I've got just a, an artist's um, impression of, of, uh, of the Aster system, which um, the satellite system, which was launched in 1999. And um, this one collects visible near short wave and thermal infrared data. I should note that the short wave infrared module is not op in operation anymore, but it's, um, it provided us with lots of data where we created then some continental scale mineral maps from Australia. Of. But also just briefly, um, we, staying at this slide, I want to point out that now finally, after a long, long, long waiting period of many years, there are more and more hyperspectral satellite systems um, launched. Um, there's Prisma, for example, which was launched last year, the Hisui um, system, which is attached to the International Space Station, and hopefully this year NMAP will be launched as well. So these, these satellite systems will give us then unprecedented um, spectral resolution of the Earth's surface um, collected from, from um, spaceborne systems. Good, moving on. Just as an example, um, why do we do that? Actually, why do we co collect reflectance spectra? Well, we would like to understand um, the mineral assemblages and hydrothermal systems. And um, the um, reflectance spectroscopy is, is a really good tool for giving us quickly lots of data. It's not a laser ICPMS tool, but it has a, um, a good enough resolution so that we can get good understanding about different minerals that are um, occurring in our mineral deposits that we are interested in. Um, like here, for example, is a cartoon from Tostal 2009 about um, an epithermal system, and we have our classical hydrothermal fracture in the middle, and then we get our quartz alunite alteration proximal to the mineralization, to the ore, and um, if, we further, if we go further distal from the, um, away from the ore zone, we basically go through different alteration zones, and all or most of these alteration minerals, all of, all of these ones apart from quartz in that case, they can be mapped using um, simply the short wave infrared part of the spectrum. So we have here the, the, the spectral signatures for alunite, kaolinite, and so forth, moving um, from proximal to distal to the ore deposit. If you want to add quartz, then you need a thermal infrared system and, and, and basically scan that part of the spectrum too. Um, so this is nice and well. This is good. We, many of us know that already. Um, but now we are also interested, of course, in, in what else can we do with, this, with these instruments. And, what other information can we extract from the reflectance spectra? And um, I would like to focus on the compositional changes now in the next slides. So let's moving on to geochemical exchange vectors. And I thought about which um, example I would give as an introduction. And I think this is one is still one of the, the best and most straight, straightforward ones that was, uh, that's about the Stara IUCG in, uh, from the Mount Isa, uh, yeah, Mount Isa and Laia for Eastern Fold Belt. And um, that one was, we did work on this in, in the, um, about 2008, when we um, published a report about this area. Um, basically what happens in, in the Stara area or the Selvin range, we have a number of IUCG deposits, which are marked here in this map in the middle by red dots. But we've got also another, of, uh, a couple of other deposit styles. We have uh, copper gold, copper deposits, and even uranium prospects. And they are highlighted in different colors here. And you notice that on the left, in, in the western part, close to the iron stones uh, that are here, um, we've got lots of IOCGs, whereas in the eastern part, along the uh, Mount Dor shear zone, especially, we've got a lot of copper deposits. And there's also the world's, I think, or one of the biggest accumulations of molybdenum is here on the southwestern tip of this Mount Dor granite. So in the eastern fold belt, we have a couple of granites intruding these um, sediments. So we have lots of uh, metasedimentary rocks here. And um, we would like to map out now, um, we, we can use the white mica um, um, composition map to map out the compositional changes of the white micas that may tell us something about fluid flow and um, the, yeah, the variations of mineral assemblages. And so on the left hand side, you see the white mica composition map. Um, it's a rainbow color stretch. So blue colors means it's an aluminum. We, we will see, we can expect aluminum rich white mica, which is like a muscovite. Um, and um, green or more yellow to red colors would be more phengitic white mica. Um, all the black areas are masked out. These are masked out pixels because there's a river or a tree or simply because there's no white, no white mica on the surface. So, and what we see, interesting enough, in that area that along this um, Mount Dor shear zone, we've got a um, high intensity of white micas. And more interestingly, even when we then move to the, to the west and to the east of this um, Mount Dor shear zone, we, we see that the, 
um, the uh, aluminum content um, in the white micas is, is changing and we're getting more phagetic micas to the west and to the east. The next slide shows a close-up of the southern um, area here um, where we have the, the, the star um, open pit basically and we see from the central part where we have the Mount Dorshier zone here the, marked by the red dots. If we go to the west and to the east we see that we uh, end up with more phagetic white micas until we hit the iron stones in the west or until we hit um, very reduced um, graphite uh, rocks, um, very reduced rocks like graphite schists here in the eastern part that occur in the eastern part. So that tells us surely something and we, we interpret this basically as uh, mapping out a fluid pathway so that the uh, hydrothermal fluids that pass through the area along the Mount Dor shear zone migrated along this, this, yeah, this shear zone and then uh, penetrated the surrounding um, um, rocks basically to the west and east and with this fluid rock interaction, we, we changed the, the composition of the, um, of, the, of the white micas. By the way, all these hyperspectral mineral maps that, you, that, I'm look, that I'm showing you here, you can freely download them from our web page as marked down there at the bottom. Um, so let's now look a little bit more closely into uh, what this means actually, the white mica chemistry. And um, so we've got here on the, in this next slide, slide number 11, on the right-hand side, there's a diagram showing the spectral signature of different mica, white micas. We've got in yellow a muscovite at the top, and um, we've got in red at the bottom a fengite. And you notice that there's a certain absorption feature, uh, which we often call the aluminum wave feature or 20 to 100 nanometer feature. We see that this absorption feature shifts to longer wavelengths if we are changing the composition of white mica from muscovite to fengite. And this largely is due to the Chermax exchange, which is specified here on the top left. In, in this um, um, diagram also, uh, we're replacing the octahedrally uh, coordinated um, aluminium in the muscovite by iron, magnesium, but we could also replace it by chromium vanadium or any other um, element that fits into the octahedral side of white mica. The Chermax exchange is a, is a coupled exchange, so with the aluminium um, replacement by iron magnesium, we also need to uh, replace um, 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 the aluminium by silica on the tetrahedral side. So it's a, it's a, it's a coupled exchange, basically. Um, just one more slide about this topic, because I just recently there was um, a, a few weeks ago, um, a couple of papers were released about um, the Calvoli superpit. And again, it was mentioned that um, there is um, paragonite existing there. Paragonite is a sodic mica. And um, that might be true in that case, and um, there are lots of case studies where people basically did the microprobe work and, and detailed analysis to map the paragonite and distinguish that from muscovite and fengite, it's all good. But um, there are also cases where people try and use just reflectance spectroscopy, just the short written thread, uh, to map, uh, to distinguish between paragonite and muscovite, and unfortunately this is not possible. Um, so that's what I'm trying to explain here in the middle of this, um, in, in this slide with the, with the compositional space of white micas. We've got basically the muscovite here at the top left, um, and the muscovite typically absorbs around 2190 nanometers. If we're then um, replacing, if, if we're basically doing this Chermax exchange and moving towards saladonite, um, then we cross the fengite field and um, we're ending up with longer wavelength white micas, so the 20 to 100 feature will be at 20 to 50. We can also use another absorption feature at 2350 nanometer to, just, to map out the iron magnesium ratio between those two. So in, even within fengite, you could estimate, um, is it more an iron rich or magnesium rich fengite? But um, as uh, Martinez Alonso has shown in 2002, there's no major impact of the sodium potassium exchange on, on the 20 to 100 nanometer absorption feature. So I just want to emphasize, please don't use this absorption feature to map out um, the sodium potassium exchange. If you want to do that, um, we would need to do a research project maybe, but um, you could maybe try the midway infrared. There are publications around that, um, for, for example, from Mario 2003, where they map out potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium exchange and smectites using the midway infrared. So it seems to work and that's maybe at least applicable for elites as well. Okay. So much about, um, well, one more thing about the white details about white biker chemistry. Um, this is a, uh, well, quite detailed table here on the right hand side, um, where we try basically to compile all the absorption features that we can find in literature um, uh, about white micas and, and, and um, also dark micas and smectites. 
And we do that basically to understand is, this, is there anything more than just magnesium iron content in micas? Um, and um, you, there are publications about the lithium content and um, something about titanium, um, but there's a much more research needed and probably there are uh, much more vibrational modes that we can detect with our sensors, with reflectance spectroscopy, we just don't know yet where they are. So in theory, they should be in certain locations, but we need to do more projects, more research too, to understand where exactly they are located. Okay. Um, but then people might ask, okay, why, why do we see that actually? Why do we see the change in white microchemistry at all? And um, there are multiple reasons in literature. There are, there are lots of papers published since the 60s, 1960s about white microchemistry change. And um, there are lots of different reasons um, that um, pro uh, proposed. Uh, one of them is simply uh, pressure and temperature changes. And it is known, described, for example, that um, the sodium is more stable in aluminum poor micas with increasing temperature. So you, you end up with uh, sodium rich fengites in some, some um, cases. Um, then um, what also was described, for example, by Rutenberg in 2012 from the Panama Panorama area in, in Western Australia. Um, he worked on some VHMS deposit and um, they mapped very nicely out um, different alteration uh, footprints, different white mica compositions and related that to um, basically seawater circulating through different rock types simply. Yeah? So in this cut, that's shown um, as a concept on, in, the, in the left part here in this diagram, where we have some um, originally some seawater um, flowing into, into the volcanic um, rocks and then leaching some elements and, it's, um, and then they're getting heat up again. And then we have this discharge site. And so we've got different white mica compositions in the re recharge and discharge site. And we can see that now on the Earth's surface and we can see it also in drill cores from that area. So in this case, um, the recharge sites are characterized by aluminum rich white micas like a muscovite and um, discharge sites by aluminum poor white micas. Um, this is just one um, example from VHMS, but there are also other um, ideas about that um, pH of the hydrothermal fluids can have an impact. And in general, the redox conditions of the fluids and other host rocks, silica and aluminum activity. So there are lots of um, different ideas. Um, and also, just um, also, I wanted to add this question um, because people are asking me that quite a lot. Um, is the phengitic mica always proximal to ore? Is there like a rule of thumb? And um, it, unfortunately, not. It's not the case. Um, we had a postdoc also a couple of years ago here at CSRO, Ray Bang, who did really great work on Canona Bell and Sunrise Dam together with John Walsh and John Cudahy. And um, I've got here two um, images of his paper from 2017 where he um, put together some 3D models in LeapFrog um, using hyperspectral data collected from uh, drill cores. And um, basically he mapped out that at Canona Bell, what we see um, more proximal to the ore, we get a fingative guide mica, whereas in Sunrise Dam, we uh, get the opposite. Sunrise Dam is marked by um, um, less fingitic mica um, proximal to the ore. And the further, further you go away from the ore, you, you're increasing the fingitic white micas. So you can have both even in the same, roughly the same, let's say the same area. But there are different deposit types. You know, Canona Bell is a bit more of a probably like a, a porphyry originally and Sunrise Dam is more, let's say, a classic orogenic gold, probably. Um, they, um, Ray also mapped out that um, there are different titanium values in the white micas in Canona Bell, depending on if you're proximal or distal to the ore. So that's maybe something also we can map out with the absorption features in the short-wave infrared or mid-wave infrared. Okay, um, just I have to rush through this slide a little bit, unfortunately, because I'm getting a bit, a bit slow with the slides here. But um, so Ray, um, I really am, am, would um, uh, recommend uh, um, Ray's paper on this because he discusses basically different uh, possibilities um, for uh, um, why we have this white microchemistry change in the fan guides. And he noticed that um, at Sunrise Dam, we've got um, the magnetite, for example, is replaced by hematite in a distal to the, um, to the ore zone, and that's the fingitic zone. So that makes sense. It's oxidized then environment. Um, and um, uh, Ray also did some sulfur isotope studies and compared that with, uh, with the white mica composition. And again, he saw that we, we, we realized that, um, again, that uh, more oxidized environments uh, correlate um, 
basically with, with different um, white mica compositions. Um, okay, I, I have to move on. Um, just to summarize this basically um, from Ray's topic, if you would um, like to apply speckled sensing in the Gilgan Craton for at least for sub amphibolite phaseous deposits, and if you're looking for porphyry style gold deposits, you probably would look for aluminium poor white mica and pyrites for the negative um, delta um, 34 of the sulfur, and um, you would look for the opposite in, in the other organic gold deposits, basically. But it's only this, you can apply that um, system only there, yeah? So it, I would be cautious with applying that same approach anywhere else in the world. You really have to first do a thorough study. Good. Um, what you, um, the, the good thing about white micas is also um, that they are rather weathering resistant. Um, and so we can even, even in areas where we have cover, we can map the white mica chemistry basically through cover. And um, Hita Lampinen, a um, PhD student who was with us, oh, at, was at UWA, she uh, worked on the upper lead zinc silver deposit in the Capricorn. And she used a combination of different technologies, the aster mineral maps, potassium radiometrics, and field spectrometer data, high level data, XID, and regular geochemistry to map out basically the mineral assemblies and geochemistry in, in ABRA. And here are some um, profiles just um, from, again, leapfrog models, um, where she basically used uh, field spectrometer data from, from chips, I think, in that case, and uh, mapped out the different SWIR active mineral assemblies here at the top right. And the bottom shows, again, the aluminum OH composition of the white micas. And Eta noticed that basically we can still see the phengetic, phengetic white micas that, that mark the, um, the uh, mineralized um, zone. We can still, still see a signature of phengetic white micas at the surface. And so she looked at some aster mineral maps. And if we just look at the bottom right picture, this one shows a combination of the aster um, composition, aluminum OH composition map, and the potassium radiometrics, and she basically uh, mapped out the different, um, or she basically proved that you can map the phengetic mica even with, with um, ASTA the satellite uh, remote sensing data in the area. Good. So, talked lots of about, of, uh, about white mica, um, but <laughs> you, I don't want to shock you, but of course there are lots of other mineral exchange vectors we can map, and this is just a few, just for some examples. And um, you, um, you can have a copy of this presentation um, um, afterwards, no problem. And I think Ryan will distribute it anyway, the link to that. Um, but basically, we see similar exchange vectors, or let's say um, exchange vectors and, and uh, spectral signatures are, uh, are changing in a, in a sim similar, similar principle to the Chermak substitution in white micas. We see similar things in chlorides, epidotes, amphiboles, in garnets, in, in um, feldspars but also not, not only in silicates, but also in sulfates like alunite, carbonates, and so forth. And you need to um, um, look at different parts of the reflectance spectrum to be able to map out these changes. So I want to move on now uh, to the garnets. And um, we're going to look at some case studies of um, um, garnets. And I just may swap the next slide and go straight to this one here. So slide number 21, um, garnets are quite common um, uh, gang minerals in scan deposits and also in Broken Hill style deposits. And they're beautiful, as you see, in, uh, as you know, on the top right here is a picture of one of the garnets, which is one of our reference uh, materials in, in the spectral library that we are putting together. And um, uh, also shown here is a thermal infrared um, spectrum of this, of this garnet here um, that you can also access, access online from the CSRO mineral spectral library. And you see this very distinct um, reflectance spectral signature of garnet. Um, this uh, spectral signature, um, the, the, the shape roughly stays the same with different garnet compositions, but it moves to the shorter and longer wavelengths, basically. And it changes also with uh, grain size and abundance of, of the garnets. So we have a closer look at one um, deposit in, in, in Peru, the Antamina um, um, scan um, deposit, and we wanted to see if we can use uh, garments to, to um, map um, different parts of the ore body, if we can distinguish endo and endoscan, and um, based on the compositional changes of the garments, basically. And we used high-logger data for that, um, but also compared with XID, 
and infrared microscope and microprobe data. And um, let's start with the infrared microscopy and the microprobe data. Um, so at Antamina, we um, um, at this uh, copper zinc molly deposit in Peru, we, we looked closely at the garnet, com at the, at, at garnet samples and did some uh, profiles in with the, with the microprobe, but also with the infrared microscope. And I compared them here and put them next to each other on the top right of this diagram. And at the bottom, I've got here the um, shown the speckled signatures and how they change, change actually how they shift from grossular on the, on, on the shorter wavelengths to androdite um, at a longer wavelengths, basically. Yeah. So if we are doing the um, look going through the aluminium ferric iron exchange in these um, calcic uh, cal sorry calcic garnets, um, we see a distinct shift of the absorption features. And we also notice that only certain garnet compositions are associated with, um, with sulfide mineralization. That's good. Um, so we mapped it out on larger scale with lots of high logger data. And um, this di these diagrams here on the right show basically the comparison of the um, absorption features of the garnets, the wavelength position of those ones with different um, sulfide types. So for each diagram, the X axis shows um, a certain absorption feature of the garnet and the Y axis uh, another, absorb another diagnostic absorption feature. And basically in this diagram, we would move from bottom left would be a grossolac um, composition and then we would go through the androdite composition and maybe even uvarovite composition. So we're going from endoscan to exoscan. Um, and this, we, we, found, we found out that we can actually map out endoscan and exoscan by comparing the garnet composition with the different sulfides. So we've got here the pyrite distribution. So um, warm colors would, be, would mean lots of, um, sul, uh, lots of pyrite here in the top left plot. Blue colors would be lower ones of pyrite. And in the top right, Plot, we've got chalcopyrite, uh, the, the, the middle um, left plot is bornite, middle right is phalarite, bottom left plot is molybdenite. And you can see really that you can nicely map out different zones of the ore body. So that works pretty well, that's good. The question then was, can we do that only from drill core or can we also use chips? There's always a little bit of a problem collecting thermal infrared spectra from, from chips. Um, but we found out that with those absorption features that we are using um, to distinguish those different compositions of the garnets, um, they are marked here in, the, in this diagram here on the right hand side by these straight lines. So these um, absorption features B, C and D and also the troughs in between, um, we can use all of them basically to map out compositional changes and we can identify them in reflectance spectra, thermal infrared reflectance spectra from drill core but also in thermal reflectance, thermal infrared reflectance spectra from um, crushed core from, uh, from chips, basically. Okay. Um, I went then, um, uh, so this was quite interesting with Antamina and quite exciting. And I thought, okay, in Australia, we're very lucky. We've got the National Virtual Core Library that was set up by, uh, by John Hundington and Lou Whitborn, mainly, and Auscope. And we are, um, have now access to more than, than 3,000 uh, drill cores across the whole continent, thanks to all the geological surveys and their hard work, scanning everyday drill cores uh, with a high logger in the visible near short and thermal infrared. So we can use the whole database maybe to look at garnet compositions. So I had some fun with uh, Kennington, Jervois, and Broken Hill. And I'm not going to de any detail into the geology of these deposits, but they are, let's, let's say, um, uh, okay, Broken Hill, obviously is a Broken Hill style deposit, uh, giving the name, but also Kennington was discussed of, as maybe Broken Hill style or maybe as a scan and Jervois, I don't know if there's any real classification of this deposit. It's not so much about also the classification, it's just about um, this exercise was more about can we map different compositions of different garnets in these different deposits? And yes, we can. So the next slide basically here shows um, the same plot I used for Antamina to distinguish the different garnet compositions. And, but now I plotted all pixels in the high logger data that contain basically garnets um, in, according to thermal infrared spectra. So that's the same diagram here on the top right that I used for Antamina. In Antamina, in the scan deposit, we mainly or almost only had grossular androdite and maybe uvarovite. Whereas now with Broken Hill, Kennington, and also good parts of Jervois, We've get, we've, we have different kinds of garnets. We've got pyrope, almondine, spessartine, especially, and so on. And um, it, was, it, it is still interesting that um, in, in Broken Hill and Kennington, we've got mainly pyrospite series garnets, 
Whereas in Jervis, in Jervis, you've got quite a mix up between pirate side, but also the Uberon side serious um, guns. So I, I don't want to say that Jervis is a scan, but a deposit, which probably not, but um, it's just um, one tool um, to use the, the thermal infrared and reflectance spectroscopy to map the compositional changes of garments and then trying to compare different deposit styles and get, get your heads around how these um, deposits also developed. Okay, let's move on in the last five minutes, <laughs> I promise, um, to cover the crystallinity, um, spectrum maturity, and also mineral hydration and hydroxylation. Um, so a, a good example, um, one of the best examples, I think, um, how we can use carrying crystallinity um, uh, for exploration is this map that uh, Tom Cudahy and his collaborators um, produced in 2005. So we've got here on the right hand side, a 100,000, one, one to 100,000 map sheet of um, uh, Kalgoorlie. And just for orientation, that's Kanona Belly at the, at the top, a um, Kalgoorlie super pit would be somewhere here in the, in the, in the middle. And um, the different colors in this map on the right hand side basically mean um, uh, different kinds of carbonite crystallinity, carbon crystallinity. Red colors, or let's say um, yellow to red colors, would be a well ordered carbonite, well crystalline. Whereas blue colors would be a poorly ordered carbonite. And um, there is this general rule of thumb where we can say, okay, a poorly ordered carbonite is probably more occurring in transported material whereas the well-ordered carbonite is occurring more in in situ material, in, in situ regolith. So you can use these maps to distinguish in situ from transported regolith, which is quite useful for exploration, especially if you are working in, in um, heavily covered areas like in, in, in Australia. It's not always that simple, of course, when you um, recrystallize the carbonite uh, with, simply with groundwater injection or whatever, you can um, get a well-ordered carbonite, but on large, it, it works quite well. And um, if you compare this map that, that Tom produced here with um, other maps that Ravi Anand produced um, from the regolith, there's a really good overlap. Yeah. So that's one way how we can use carbonate crystallinity. Um, the next slide now shows one of these um, uh, crystal models again of, of carbonate. And um, I, I just want to show this because just to emphasize that we also understand actually perfectly well which parts of the crystal lead to which absorption feature. And that's not only spectral nerd um, satisfaction. Um, this actually has quite some use because if we understand the different absorption features of the different minerals, then they, we can extract even more information from those ones that will help us with exploration and, and resource characterization. So on the, on the right hand side, I've got a, a number of different clay minerals um, um, at the top, carinite and carinite, and we see um, that they all have this uh, um, absorption feature at 20 to 100 nanometers, um, but also another one or two maybe around 1400 nanometers, and some of them have this absorption feature at 1900 nanometers, yeah, which is due to water. And um, or if I go to that, before I go to this one, um, the crystallinity of the carina can be um, inferred from the uh, shape of this absorption feature at 20 to 100 nanometers. That's well described and well known already. Um, the, the polymorphism of different kaolin group minerals um, can also be identified. So we can distinguish kaolinite and dikite simply by measuring the distance of the most intense absorption bands in this wavelength region. And we can also distinguish bound from unbound water, for example. And that's quite interesting here in this with these uh, reflecting spectra. Uh, if you look at the Mount Mirablenite or Smectite, for example, we see that there's a uh, uh, it's kind of a mix between a, um, a very um, concise water feature. So we have this pointy end here, which tells us there's some bound water, but there's also a pretty broad absorption feature of the 1900 nanometer feature. Um, so which tells us there's unbound water as well. Um, and you see how these, the relative intensity of unbound versus bound water changes also with the different minerals. And these are just a ex single example of standard minerals, basically. Yeah? Um, now we can um, usually the, the the type of of clays uh, can be very well extracted from XRD, but we can also use um, a reflectance spectroscopy to to identify um, the different clay types, and we can go to quite some detail. Um, and I just want to highlight with the slide thirty three um, the different indices that Michael Dubli um, published in two thousand ten, um, which he called the Elite Spectral Maturity Indices. 
and um, you can use the different um, absorption features of the, uh, which are related to um, hydroxyls, to the aluminum OH basically, um, but also the water absorption features. You can use the shape of both of these absorptions and the relative intensity to um, derive different electrolyte spectral maturity indices, yeah? And I don't want to um, get told up by explaining different indices. You can see them all there, and when you get the copy of the PowerPoint, you can follow that up later. But the one way you could use that is you go to a totally um, new um, 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 area that you may have never, never worked in, like it was for us in the case with working on the Southern Thompson origin, we worked together with GA and GSQ and, and New South Wales Surgical Survey on that. And we looked at a couple of high logger data here um, where we mapped out um, in these plots is shown basically the white marker abundance down, down the drill core. So down drill cores on the, on the Y axis. And um, the X axis would be a relative abundance of white mica. And then we colored this one up by the white mica composition in, this, in the first um, diagram here on the left side in the first column the most left column. And again, the colors mean uh, warm colors would be phengitic white mica, blue colors would be, or green colors would be more musco white mica, style, style of white mica. Um, the next column um, shows again the white mica abundance, but this time I colored up by the elite spectral maturity that Michael Dublier developed. And it turned out that the elite spectral maturity increases quite significantly in this area here, um, where we have um, lots of um, very high, high, highly altered porphyritic intrusives, and we've got some mafic intrusive rocks, but we've also got lots of carbonate waning in this area. So there is quite some hydrothermal alteration happening in this area, and it's not only influencing the white marker composition, it's also influ influencing the elite spectral maturity, so different types of elite. So it's just another parameter that can tell us something about the extent of the hydrothermal alteration, but also how that whole thing developed, basically. And you can do the same thing for chloride. Um, there's also a chloride special maturity index available as well. They can play the same game. Good. Um, and this is interesting for exploration, but also for the resources industry if you um, are going into the mining. If you, if you want to uh, process ore, um, um, clay minerals often pose uh, quite some problem, especially smectites or interlayered elite smectite. So especially people that are interested in porphyry copper deposits, um, they are faced with lots of these, of these minerals, different kinds of micas, different kinds of um, elites and interlayered and so on. And um, I just dropped this slide in here to emphasize that, that that's something we're working on, on here in CSRO as well um, for, um, to, to understand better how we can distinguish different types of aluminum smectite, um, uh, yeah, different types of smectites. Can we map out elite smectite interlayered versions? Can we map out different elite types, different kinds of white micas? And um, we are developing different algorithms to extract this information basically from the reflectance spectra. And we're using the whole reflectance spectrum from the visible to the thermal infrared for these kind of um, analysis. Um, and this is useful for a porphyry copper deposits, for example, or many, many other deposits. Clays are often a headache, um, but also for the iron ore industry. And there um, was a quite nice uh, paper, um, an abstract published by Gilroy on 2018, which where they basically explained how they use um, reflectance spectroscopy um, collected from um, blast holes, but also mine face imagery um, to, identify, to understand the mineralogy of the deposits, so what kind of iron ore. Uh, iron oxide they're dealing with, goethite, hematite, and what kind of goethite it is, but also what the moisture content is in the ore. And they want to understand where, map, map out where's the problematic ore. If they know where's, where's the problematic ore, then they can avoid things like here on the top right, where the, the processing plant is basically clogged up with lots of claims. And so it's very important for them to do that. And um, there are a number of companies working in this field now. And uh, Cesar Rose working together with them on that. Okay. I'm heavily over time. I'm sorry about that. Just the last slide, so um, a summary. Um, reflectance spectroscopy is a powerful tool for determining the composition, composition of hydrothermal alteration minerals. That's well known. Um, but we, we have to be careful with how we interpret the data. Yeah? Um, so we need to avoid wrong interpretation of the wavelength shifts like the sodium potassium exchange white micas, which doesn't really work in the short wave infrared. If, we, if it's important, then we might need to look at the mid wave infrared to solve that. More research is needed. For exploration, 
um, mapping the chemical gradient is often more important than focusing on certain end members. Like we, like Ray Wang showed in Canona Bell and Sunrise Dam, it's it it's maybe not most important if you're ending up with Hengar that you are not. Important is to map the chemical gradients. Um, the reasons for compositional changes of minerals and in which deposit style they occur is quite poorly understood. And again, we need more uh, research on that. Um, and I would have, would also recommend to look beyond white mica and chloride composition just. Um, there are many, many more physical chemical gradients that we can trace in the infrared part of the spectrum. Also, look beyond chemical exchange vectors, crystallinity, spectral maturity, and uh, hydration versus hydroxylation and so on. They all provide important information. And I also um, want to emphasize the, the opportunity of applying all these parameters to the whole mine life cycle. So not just exploration, or when you collect these data from exploration, you can make use of them for, for the mining, informing the mining and the processing, and maybe even attaining stamps and also environmental impact assessments. Okay, thanks so much, everyone. Um, sorry to be so much over time, and I hand back to Ryan. Carsten, uh, we really appreciate your presentation. Just stop that now. We do.